Hi, and welcome back to First Year Undergraduate Microeconomics. We've been looking at a sales tax. That's a situation when buyers and sellers have to pay a tax to the government when they engage in trade. It's called a goods and services tax in Australia, or a value-added tax in Europe. The sales tax puts a wedge between the price buyers pay and the price that sellers receive. Or in other words, the price that buyers pay is equal to the price that sellers receive, plus the tax to the government. In our running example, we've been looking at the pizza market, and the tax per pizza has been $2.50, and our equilibrium has involved buyers paying a price of $17.50 for the pizza, $2.50 of that goes to the government, which means that the amount that sellers receive is given by $17.50 less $2.50, that's $15 to the seller. And we've illustrated our sales tax on our demand and supply diagram by using what I'll call the wedge approach. We've been looking for a price to buyers that is exactly T dollars, the amount of the sales tax, above the price that sellers receive. We've also been looking for a situation where Given the price buyers pay, the amount that they want to buy, Q1, given by the demand curve, is the same as the amount that sellers wish to sell, Q1, given the price that sellers receive, given P1S, the supply curve tells us sellers would like to sell Q1. So buyers would like to buy Q1, sellers would like to sell Q1, they match, so we're in an equilibrium. The amount of money that the government raises from the tax is given by the size of the tax, T dollars, or the height of this rectangle. That's the tax per unit, times the number of units, times the number of pizzas sold, which is Q1. So that red rectangle represents the amount of money or the amount of revenue the government raises from the tax. We can break that into two bits, the top area, which I'll call area A, and the bottom bit, which I'll call Area B. Area A is the amount of tax revenue that's effectively paid by the buyers. So this is the amount of tax revenue that's borne by the buyers. It reflects that buyers pay a higher price after the tax is in place. The height of that rectangle A is the change in the price to the buyers, and the length, Q1, is the amount that the buyers buy. So the area of rectangle A is the amount of money the buyers pay to the government. The other part of government revenue, area B, is the amount of tax borne by the sellers. Sellers receive a lower price after the tax, and area B is simply the reduction in the price sellers receive, that's the height of a rectangle B, times the quantity Q1. So B is the amount of money, or tax revenue, that is effectively paid by the sellers. So far, to find the equilibrium under a sales tax, I've put a wedge between demand and supply. The top of the wedge has told me the price that buyers pay. The bottom of the wedge has told me the price that sellers receive. Another way of finding the equilibrium that some of your lecturers might have done involves creating a construction line. That construction line can be the same as the supply curve, except shifted up by T dollars, or the construction line can be the same as the demand curve, shifted down by T dollars. In this presentation, I'm going to show you how to find the equilibrium using one or other of those construction lines. Then, in the second part of this presentation, I'm going to show you what those construction lines mean mathematically. Now, if you don't like the maths, you can skip that part of the presentation, but if you're okay with the maths, it's useful to see exactly what those construction lines mean. Let's look at our first case. On this diagram, we've got our standard tax equilibrium. We've got the quantity of pizza on the horizontal axis, and we've got the price, or dollars, on the vertical axis. We've got a price that buyers pay, P1B, and that price is exactly T dollars above the price that sellers receive, P1S. Given P1B, buyers would like to buy Q1. Given P1S, sellers would like to sell Q1, so we've got an equilibrium. 
I've also drawn on this construction line, which I'll call S plus T. It's called S plus T because it's exactly T dollars above the original supply curve. So that arrow there is exactly T dollars in height. So the construction line S plus T is just identical to the supply curve, except moved up by exactly T dollars. Now the benefit of creating this construction line is that if you look at where S plus T, our construction line, intersects the demand curve D, notice that where that occurs is exactly the price that buyers pay. So we can use our construction line, the intersection of our construction line, and our demand curve to find one of our prices, the buyer price. Given the buyer price, the demand curve tells us the equilibrium quantity, Q1, and then we can work out how much sellers receive by going from Q1 back up to the supply curve. That will tell us the supplier's price, P1S. So this construction line, S plus T, which is the supply curve shifted up by exactly T dollars, is a useful way of finding our equilibrium. On this diagram, we show how to find our equilibrium using a different construction line. This construction line is labelled D minus T. Why? Well, the construction line is exactly T dollars below the demand curve. So we get our construction line by shifting our demand curve down by exactly T dollars. Notice that where our construction line, D minus T, intersects our supply curve, that's this point here, that gives us the price sellers receive. So our construction line helps us find one of our prices. Given the price sellers receive, we can find the equilibrium quantity by the supply curve, Q1. Given the equilibrium quantity, we can find out the price that buyers pay by going up to the demand curve, going across, that tells us the other price, the buyer price. So this construction line, D minus T, is a useful shortcut to find our equilibrium. One word of caution, if you use these shortcuts, make sure you only use one of the construction lines. Either use S plus T or use D minus T. Don't use them both, otherwise you'll get it wrong. Now to the mathematics. What do these construction lines actually mean? Let's think about S plus T first. Note that when we draw our supply curve, we're actually drawing the supply curve as a function of the price sellers receive. Similarly, when we draw our demand curve, we're actually drawing it as a function of the price buyers pay. Now, when there was no sales tax, so the price sellers received was the same as the price buyers paid, we didn't have to worry about this. We just talked about supply as being a function of the price and demand as being the function of the price. But with a sales tax, we've got two prices. So we have to remember which function depends on which price. The supply curve is a function of the price sellers receive. The demand curve is a function of the price buyers pay. Well, what if instead of thinking of dollars on the vertical axis, we actually explicitly think of the vertical axis as measuring the buyer price? Well, in that case, our demand curve is a function of the buyer price. It doesn't change. The demand curve as drawn is a function of the buyer price. But the supply curve, as we've drawn it here, is a function of the price sellers receive. If we wanted to draw the supply curve as a function of the price buyers pay, we would need to shift the supply curve up by exactly the T dollars of the tax, the T dollars that separates the price suppliers receive from the price buyers pay. So what this supply curve, this S plus T, actually is, is it's the supply curve drawn as a function of the price that buyers pay. So if we think about our vertical price as being the buyer price or the price buyers pay, then we would have to change our supply curve. It wouldn't be this line down here because that's a function of the price sellers receive. It would be this higher dotted line which is the function of the price buyers pay, where 
demand as a function of the price buyer's pay, intersects supply as a function of the price buyer's pay, that intersection, well, that gives us the equilibrium price that buyers pay. The same holds for our other construction line. Here we've got our normal supply and demand curves. They're functions of, well, supply is a function of the price sellers receive, demand is a function of the price buyers pay. But what happens if on our vertical axis, rather than just thinking of dollars, we want to think about it as the price to sellers, the price sellers receive? Well, we wouldn't need to change our supply curve, because that is a function of the price sellers receive. But we would need to change our demand curve, because it's a function of the price that buyers pay. To come up with our demand curve as a function of the price that sellers receive, we would need to shift our demand curve down by exactly T dollars, the T dollars that separates the price buyers pay and the price sellers receive, we would need to shift our demand curve down by T dollars at every quantity. So we can think of our construction line D minus T as simply being the demand curve not as a function of the price buyers pay, but rather the demand curve as a function of the price sellers receive. Now, where supply as a function of the price sellers receive, intersects demand as a function of the price that sellers receive. That's given by this point here, and that gives us our equilibrium price that sellers receive. Given this one price, we can then work out our equilibrium quantity, and we can work out our other price. Now, personally, I prefer to use the wedge approach, the approach I've used in the earlier presentations, because that allows us to just keep price or dollars up on this vertical axis, and we can consider both buyer and seller prices on the same diagram. However, if your lecturer insists, or if you prefer, using the construction line approach, please feel free to do so, but it's a good thing to understand exactly what you're doing. What you're really doing is insisting that the vertical axis either measures the price that buyers pay or measures the price that sellers receive. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's good to know what you're actually doing. Thanks for listening.